Good morning, everyone. Looks like spring break starts uh, <laughs> soon. Um, luckily, we're recording. But um, thanks for being here this morning. So I wanted to pick up from uh, two of the Lewis structures on this page that I didn't actually talk about last time. That's O2 and N2. Just kind of missed them on this page. And so when we're thinking of a Lewis structure for oxygen, it really becomes relatively, I think, easy to think of oxygen in terms of just one O atom has six valence electrons. So we can think I have oxygen with six valence electrons. And then I have another oxygen with the exact same count. And if these oxygen atoms can share electrons, they can get toward that noble gas count of electrons or that octet count. Um, so we can see that each oxygen can satisfy the octet rule and have two electrons, or excuse me, eight electrons surrounding it with a double bond. So each of those bonds has two electrons being shared. And so it's each oxygen atom obtaining a total of eight electrons by sharing them. And then when we start thinking about the average charge of atoms, we're getting into the concept of formal charge. Just think of, you know, what would this atom be in terms of just the net charge? And the net charge, we're just thinking, well, oxygen, if it has six electrons, has a neutral charge. So these are just simple neutral oxygen atoms here. So neither oxygen atoms picking up a charge. That makes sense. O2 is overall neutral. We might remember from oxidation numbers, each O should have a zero oxidation number. And they do. Each oxygen has a zero charge in the atom, so we have uncharged atoms. Same thing with nitrogen. Only difference for nitrogen is we have five total electrons um, per atom. And so we're going to go triple for nitrogen so that we can obtain that count of eight surrounding each nitrogen atom. So if I go with a triple bond here, then I have you know, the satisfaction of the octet rule. So eight electrons around each nitrogen. And then on average, I still have five electrons closest to each nitrogen atom. So again, neutral nitrogen atoms in charge. So we're gonna think about formal charge a lot today when we start going through different types of Lewis structures. Um, so another thought of charge is how there can be a charge imbalance based on the atoms that make up a bond. And so there's two types of bonds we can talk about when we're dealing with covalent bonds, covalence when we're sharing electrons. So bond polarity is going to be a measure of the sharing of those electrons. A nonpolar bond is where the electrons in the bond are equally shared. So if we think of a bond that has two identical atoms, the idea would be that we have like a tug of war going on for those electrons. You can imagine one nuclei is trying to pull them closer towards itself, the other nuclei is trying to do the same. And so you have two equally identical nuclei pulling on an electron pair, so these are negative electrons. So they're pulling equally hard on each electron. So they're perfectly shared equally. That's the idea of covalent bonding is perfectly shared electron pairs. We would call it a nonpolar covalent bond when that's the case. A polar covalent bond is when we have, a, say, a different atom, let's say hydrogen, bonded with fluorine. And then hydrogen has a different like pole. Its nucleus doesn't have as strong of a positive charge doesn't have as high of an effective nuclear charge. Fluorine's effective nuclear charge is higher, so fluorine's gonna pull that electron pair in the bond. It's gonna take these two electrons that are both negative and pull it closer towards the fluorine nucleus. This is going to allow fluorine to adopt a partial negative. You can think partial negative meaning the delta meaning partial. And by partial, we mean it's not fully minus one. If it could completely grab the electron pair, it would have went to F minus one, H plus one. So it doesn't quite get to the case where it can go to hydrogen plus F minus. So it doesn't quite get as far as this. So we don't form the case where we have hydrogen ion and fluoride ion, but somewhere in between. And it actually turns out we can calculate precisely what the charges are on fluorine. We'll see that calculation in a moment. But if we knew a few experimental details, and if we can think about how charge is transferred between particles, we can sort of be able to calculate what these partial charges are. We're going to see that they're pretty close to about 0.5. So fluorine ends up being about negative 0.5 units of charge, hydrogen about 0.5 positive units of charge. So almost equally between uncharged neutral and um, ionized as H plus and F minus. And so now our charge is in F2, perfectly zero. If we look at HF, the idea of, th there's like two concepts that we we'll talk about charge a fair bit. One is the concept of formal charge. So the formal charge will say break the bond in half, calculate the charge on F, calculate the charge on H, 
the formal charges here would be zero for hydrogen, zero for fluorine. Now that's like a formal charge assuming the bond's equally shared. Once we then think, okay, is the bond actually going to equally share the electrons, we can break that assumption and get rid of it and then say, oh, actually fluorine wants electrons more, it's smaller, more positive, fluorine's actually going to be negative charged. So we'll, we'll try to also compare for a lot of different bonds, what are the actual charges? So we get some partial positive on hydrogen, some partial negative on the fluorine. So when we talk about formal charges, we're just saying sketch a Lewis structure and then consider the bonding pair electrons are equally shared. And then after you make that assumption or, or make that calculation of the formal charges, then think how the charges will adjust in the real molecule once we then assume that different elements can have a different pole on electrons. So if we then compare the kind of gamut between nonpolar covalent, so F2 is nonpolar, meaning each of the atoms are uncharged, so neutral charges. If we have lithium fluoride, this is really going to look like lithium plus F minus because we have an ionic compound. So for our ionic compound, we're developing the full units of charge here of plus and minus one. And this plus one electron, minus one electron. So when we start thinking of electron charge as a partial charge, you're going to see that we use a unit relative to the charge of an electron. But for a moment, let's make sure that when we say the charge on lithium is plus one, it's like plus one electron, minus one electron. So like sometimes we don't think that it's the added electron that makes F the F minus, the lossy electron makes lithium to lithium plus, so it's plus one in terms of electron charge units, minus one electron charge units and lithium fluoride, and the HF's in the middle. So HF we're gonna see is in the middle where it has those partial negative and partial positive charges. So if we thought about electronegativity and just kind of thought to ourselves, which elements in the periodic table might be able to pull electrons in a bond closest towards itself, that's the concept of electronegativity. So electronegativity is in a bond, which nuclei have a stronger desire for electrons? First thing to note is that there's no noble gases. Why are there no noble gases here? They don't tend to form bonds. So electronegativity is a property an element has when it's in a bond with another element. So the noble gases aren't really participating in bonding, so we don't see them have a trend for electronegativity. Um, second thing would be, if you're thinking of what factors are going to make an atom have a high electronegativity, which would be a high desire to pull electrons towards itself, you would probably think two things. The higher the positive charge in the nucleus, the better, and then the smaller the atom, the better. Now, if you remember, we do have that counterposing trend where it's actually iodine down the row actually has the higher charge, but iodine's bigger. So we yet again find ourselves into a dilemma of size versus charge, which one is going to win out. And if you remember, it's kind of funny how for ionization energy, being, uh, uh, being smaller gives the atom a higher ionization energy, being bigger, so the size trend went one out for ionization energy. Electron affinity was kind of like in the middle. It was actually chlorine. The, the third row is what maxed out for electron affinity. So being in the third row allows an atom to absorb an electron most favorably. For whatever reason, the third row wins out the size versus charge battle. So what I'm trying to say is I don't know if we would have had a good guess on which element would win, but it turns out that it's fluorine. So it turns out that fluorine being small and having that relatively high positive charge is really good for it in bonds to pull electrons more closer towards itself. Now, when we circle back and think about chapter four, remember the rule that fluorine in compounds always has the charge of minus one. This is the reason why. The explanation is that fluorine's always going to have a stronger desire for electrons in a bond. That atom's going to go negative and make the other atoms go positive. There's a Lewis structure later for a molecule like this, but I think we can relatively easily look at a Lewis structure for a molecule like OF2. If you remember, this was the one from um, oxidation numbers. We would have set fluorine to minus one, oxygen to adjust positive to make up for it. If we think of a structure for this molecule, we could kind of almost think of just a simple dot diagram of fluorine with one extra atom that needs an electron. So we pair up that with the oxygen atom and we just do that twice. So fluorine has seven valence electrons, so we pair the one electron up with oxygen's unpaired electron, and then we make a molecule like OF2. And then once we make this molecule, I think then you can sort of see the idea that the formal charge here on fluorine would be zero, right? The, there's no net charge built up in the Lewis structure for the fluorine atom. There's no net charge on oxygen. If we break those bonds in half and assume they're equally shared to calculate the formal charges, 
the atoms have zero formal charges. So when you're thinking of calculating a formal charge, just literally box the atom. All the non-bonding pairs on an atom stay on the atom that they're attached to, and then you're just breaking the bonding pair electrons in half. So oxygen still has a neutral charge, the fluorines are still neutral. But now, fluorine's more electronegative. It's going to pull this bonding pair electrons closer towards the fluorine atoms, allowing fluorine to go partial negative because it's pulling electrons more negative charge towards that atom, so that atom builds up a negative charge. And then oxygen adjusts accordingly and has a pos partial positive charge. And so this, these charges here were trying to help us get the magnitude of the sign right. They are trying to get us to see that oxygen should be the plus atom, fluorine should be the minus atom. So for a lot of molecules, we'll see that there's some agreement between um, not the actual charges from the oxidation numbers, but from the sign of the charge. So if you go back to oxidation number rules and you predict an atom should have a positive charge, it should be the partial positive. If you predict an atom should have a negative charge, it should be the partial negative. It doesn't quite get the minus one right because this isn't F minus O2 plus. It's really not an ionic compound. It's still a molecular compound where we're sharing these electron pairs, just not equally. And so we call this a dipole arrow. And then a molecule that does this, that has the unequal sharing of electrons, we call that, um, so we call this a polar molecule. And we call this like little arrow here, this is the dipole moment. So polar molecules have dipole moments. More polar molecules, the greater these charges, the larger the value of that vector, the larger the value of that dipole moment. So more polar molecules have larger dipole moments. Um, and so the dipole moment kind of gives us a way to measure the polarity of the molecule, it gives us a way to measure the relative charges, the magnitudes of those charge. So we'll see a few examples of this. One, because we could put some math to it for some molecules. For diatomic, we well, can actually do this for larger molecules, but the math becomes really gory. But for diatomic molecules, there's a relatively easy way for us to sort of um, get an experimental parameter called the dipole moment. So this is just a value that you can determine from an experiment. Um, so you can experimentally determine a dipole moment. And then what it's related to is the magnitudes of charge, the Q plus and the Q minus, that are being separated by some distance, where the distance R here is just the bond length of the molecule, which is another experimentally determinable value. So you can do experiments that can determine a bond length. You can do experiments that can determine a dipole moment. And then from those two together, we can calculate what the magnitudes of charge that are being separated in these types of diatomic molecules. And if we just took a little uh, look here for HF to HCl to HBr to HI, the bond length's growing because the, as we go from F to Cl to Br to I, the atom's growing. So this trend here increasing, I think, makes sense that we get the increasing bond length when we go from top to bottom. But then the dipole moment, if you think about HF fluorine's the most electronegative, it's probably going to pull the electrons more closer towards itself, probably should pick up a bigger magnitude of charge, ends up with a larger dipole moment, and then the dipole moment's decreasing as we go down this group here. So we get the decreasing dipole moment because we're going to a less um, electronegative atom as we go from top to bottom. And so the magnitude of charge, if we're thinking of this, the magnitude of the charge on the atoms should be decreasing as we go from top to bottom. So HF should end up with the highest magnitude of charge. HI should end up with the lowest magnitude of charge. Um, so HF should be the most polar, the most uh, highest charges on the atoms, and then HI would have the lowest charges um, and be the closest to what we might think of as being nonpolar covalent. Nonpolar covalent would be zero charges. So if a bond's nonpolar or covalent, the dipole moment should be perfectly zero. So we should get a dipole moment. If we had F2, for example, the dipole moment of F2 would be perfectly zero. And then so the lower the dipole moment, the more the molecule's looking like a nonpolar molecule or has really low or zero charges built up on its atoms. Okay, now we can actually mathematically calculate the charges. We just have to go through a couple conversions and discuss a few of them. So let's look at this question here. So we have uh, the, the bond length and the dipole moment of HF, which were on the previous slide. It was 0.92 angstrom um, and 1.82 Debye. So this unit here is called Debye for Peter Debye. Um, so that's the unit of measure of dipole moments. Now that's a non-SI unit. The conversion to SI units, 
charge being separated by some distance, so the SI units of dipole moment are coulombs times meters, because the SI unit of charge is coulombs, and then the bond length um, should be in meters to be in SI units. So our conversion for one Debye into SI units is 3.34 times 10 to the minus 30 coulomb meters are equal to one Debye. And then we're also going to need to use the charge of an electron. The charge of an electron is in coulombs 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So this problem is really kind of just the idea of using the, the equation mu is equal to Q times R. Um, I think this equation is usually on the uh, midterms when we have this topic on the test. I'm pretty certain that this equation is a given. Uh, but you can kind of see that it's Q times R from the units of dipole moment as well. When you inspect the dipole moment, you see it's coulombs times meters. And so we just need the charge to be in coulombs, the bond distance to be in meters, and we need the, the dipole moment to be in coulombs times meters. So if what we want to do is picture this molecule where we know it should be partial negative on the fluorine, partial positive on the hydrogen, we want to calculate what those partial charges are and put a number to it. So if we try to solve for Q, and let me also mention that this would be, you know, plus Q, and this will be, the, the fluorine charge will be minus Q. So Q is just the magnitude of that charge. So when I say partial negative, partial positive, that's what I'm saying, that that's the Q value. So that's the actual charge, uh, but in units of coulombs. So when I think of Q as being equal to mu over R, and I have my dipole moment, it's 1.82 Debye, and if I just do this calculation, this isn't gonna work because the units don't necessarily match up. So I just have to do a little bit of work to get the units to work out here. I can almost tell you on a test, they'll give you that answer as one of the options. Like if you just took this Debye, divide by 0.92 angstrom and got a charge out of it, that's not going to be the right answer. Almost, if it's a multiple choice question, guarantee you it's one of the choices. But all we have to do is do the conversion that one Debye is 3.34 times 10 to the minus 30 coulomb meters, coulombs times meters. And the one silly thing is notice how it's 3.34 times 10 to the minus 30. We have Planck's constant times 10 to the minus 34, so it's really easy to write this as 10 to the minus 34, not to the minus 30. But just make sure to note that number there is to the minus 30. And then we'll convert angstrom to uh, meters. One angstrom is a 10 to the minus 10 meter. So we just use that conversion factor here. And so let's do that together, or I'll do it. So I get 6.61 times 10 to the minus 20 coulombs. And so then if we look at the, so, so that would be the charge that's building up on one H atom and one F atom and one molecule of H atom. So that's the precise charge on a single atom of each H and fluorine in the molecule of H atom. And so this would be the plus of that. So this would be the plus 6.61 times 10 to the minus 20 coulombs. And this will be the minus 6.61 times 10 to the minus 20 coulombs. Now think for a minute. If this was H plus and F minus, then this would have been, this should have worked out to be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So the unit that you might want to give this charge in, because that's a small number, we, like, you may say, well, how does that compare to the charge of one electron? If you notice, the problem says give the charge in electronic charge units. What that means is just take this number of coulombs. So if we take the 6.61 times 10 to the minus 20 coulombs and just divide it by the charge of one electron. That puts that charge into the units of charge relative to that of an electron. So if we divide that charge by 1.602 e to the minus 19, I get 0 0.41 electron charge units. Now again, think if I got 1.0. If I got 1.0, then this would be an ionic compound. This would be H plus F minus. But it's not quite 
one. It's not quite plus one, minus one. That's why we say partial. So it's somewhere between zero, which would be nonpolar covalent, and, and one. And so this is equal to plus 0 0.41 on the hydrogen, and then on the fluorine, negative 0 0.41 electron charge units. So it gives us an idea that fluorine is the most electronegative atom on the periodic table, and then hydrogen for the non-metallic elements is one of the lowest in uh, electronegativity. So the difference in electronegativity is really great for HF. So HF is about as polar covalent as you can get without being ionic. So if we exchange hydrogen for lithium, sodium, potassium on the electronegativity chart, the difference is a lot greater, then those are just going to go to lithium plus, fluorine minus, sodium plus, fluorine minus. So we're just going to get ionic compounds. So if we're on the, the side of being a molecular compound, this is about as nonpolar covalent as you get. It gives us an idea that um, the charges are going to be somewhere around half, or a little bit less than half the unit of the charge relative to an electron or lower when we're dealing with a polar covalent compound. The, uh, if we were comparing, I meant to copy a slide over, if we wanted to compare you know, HF to say HI, that HF's charge is about 0 0.41, and if we were to repeat this calculation, it's not exactly a fun calculation to go back through this with the bond length and the dipole moment for HI, but if we go through this for HI, we'd get about 0 0.06 units of charge relative to the electron. Just showing that HI is less polar um, than HF, so it's the magnitudes of charge are lower, it's closer towards being nonpolar covalent than HF is for sure. Now one other detail is when I look at the dipole moment, Q times R, it's kind of interesting that the dipole moment, if the charge magnitude were the same for a given bond, if the charge magnitude's the same, but the bond length grows, the dipole moment would be bigger. So that dipole moment is directly proportional to bond length, but for HI, the problem is that the magnitudes of charge are mostly dictated by the electronegativity differences. So the difference of electronegativity, H and I are closer together electronegativity, so the electronegativity difference plays a big role in the magnitudes of the charge. So even though HI, HI has a longer bond, that that longer bond length doesn't allow the dipole moment to be bigger because the magnitudes of charge are smaller. So dipole moment, it's, you know, I, to be fair, I think a lot of my colleagues will say it's directly, and I did kind of say it earlier too, that it's a major polarity, but it's not a direct major polarity. Q is really the major polarity. Q is what tells you how polarized the bond is, because it tells you what the magnitudes of charge are. And it's directly related to the difference of electronegativity. The dipole moment has a trend where if you have the same charges, but one bond's longer, it has a bigger dipole moment. But does that make the bigger dipole moment molecule be more polar? No, it's Q's the same. It's identical in polarity. So the magnitudes of charge are really the major polarity. Dipole moment kind of becomes related to that if you're comparing atoms that are similar size. So if you're not worrying or caring about the size of atoms, the greater difference in electronegativity, generally more polar, and you would probably say generally a greater dipole moment as well. And so, um, so when we're ranking bonds by uh, polarity, if we're trying to guess which bond's the most polar, the most polar bond is the one with the greatest difference of electronegativity. And let's, you know, um, it's not easy for me to flip back in the slides, but if you flip back in your notes to the electronegativity chart, when we pointed out fluorine's the most electronegative, notice how you get a consistent left to right increase towards fluorine and a consistent decrease from top to bottom. So electronegativity is increasing left to right and then it's decreasing top to bottom, just to make sure we point out those trends. And so then just take a minute, you can just, we won't do this in the quiz format, but just try to think of which of these bonds will have the greatest difference of electronegativity just based on the position of the atoms on the periodic table. I'll give you a minute or two on this one. <laughs> 
So what do we think here? So fluorine's most electronegative, and then of these, nitrogen and chlorine are the least electronegative, like because we know nitrogen is going to be less than O, which is less than F. And so we don't have a choice of FCl. If we did, we'd have a tricky question. But between NO, NF, and NCl, that the electronegativities are low for N and Cl. So the difference of electronegativity for N and Cl doesn't seem like that's going to be a very big difference. And then fluorine's the most, nitrogen is the least. So we're going to get the biggest difference between the NF bond. So the NF bond should be the most polar have, because it has the greatest difference of electronegativity. Um, if you went with this one, F2 is the least polar. So it doesn't matter that fluorine's electronegative when it's paired up with itself because it's the difference of electronegativity would be exactly zero. So perfectly nonpolar. So F2 would have the least polarity because it's perfectly nonpolar. NCL, if you're looking at the chart, we usually don't give you the chart, but if you look at the chart, that this one's pretty close to zero difference as well. So N and CL, not very electronegative, um, or not a big difference of electronegativity. Um, and then the NO bond should be, you know, certainly a polar bond. And so the most electronegative elements, which ones are those? So it's nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, and then maybe sulfur as well. That the idea would be if you take these atoms here and pair them up with anything but themselves, and don't worry about the nuance when they pair, like the N and Cl happen to both be the same electronegativity. If you look at a molecule like NCl3, it turns out it has a big enough dipole moment, I would call it polar. So I would say if you take any of these atoms, pair them up with any other atom except themselves, then that molecule is going to be a, or that bond's going to be polar. So a bond's polar when it's you know, has a great difference of electronegativity. Our textbook used to put a difference. It doesn't anymore. In some textbooks, like high school books, you may have seen this before, say that if the electronegativity difference is greater than two, it's ionic. If it's between, I think it used to be 0.4 and 1.9, um, that that would be nonpolar covalent, and less than 0.4 would be nonpolar. I would take it more on a scale to be the smaller the difference, the closer it is the nonpolar covalent, or the lesser polar character the bond has. So a small difference in electronegativity, is on the nonpolar side of the spectrum, and the greater the difference in electronegativity, the more polar character or the more polar the bond is. So I'd more think of it as a continuum as opposed to just saying, is that polar versus nonpolar? Um, truly speaking, a, non, a bond's only nonpolar when it's the exact same atom paired up with itself. Um, any other bond, even if electronegativities are the same, like N and Cl that I pointed out, does actually still have a small difference of electronegativity. Um, so, if we're being really technical, I would say the only nonpolar bond is the exact same atom paired up with itself, and then everything else is polar, just a degree to which you know it is in terms of rank ordering. So most of our questions on this topic tend to be which bond is the most polar, or can we put them in order of polarity, where we're just ranking those based on trends of differences of electronegativity, and taking advantage of the fact the right side element's more polar, or more electronegative, the left side element's less electronegative. All right, so let's get into some Lewis structures. So pretty much the, the remaining notes on chapter eight will be a lot of nuances of Lewis structures and how we sketch Lewis structures for different types of compounds. And we're gonna see that there's kind of like three basic approaches. There's gonna be an approach for diatomic molecules. Um, then there's going to be an approach for larger molecules. And we can almost have two different approaches for those that we'll see. Um, one, like some Lewis structures will be easier than others to put together um, atoms from you know, just how many electrons they have as if they're like a normal atom. For example, carbon monoxide, if we were to start with the picture like this for carbon, we have one of two ways we can start for carbon too. And we have oxygen with its count. We're gonna have a pretty hard time sketching the Lewis structure. But if we then, if we instead just count up the electrons I have available, I have four for carbon, that's the valence count. The oxygen valence count is six. Anytime I'm counting electrons from this, well, really, any point in chapter eight, I'm always counting valence electrons, not total. So my valence count are 10. I wanna show the valence electrons in the Lewis structure. Now, I have one little thing for diatomic molecules is that they should generally satisfy the octet rule if it's possible. So as long as I have at least eight electrons for the molecule, I should be able to satisfy the octet rule. And so now, how can I satisfy the octet rule for each atom? Um, the way I could do that for carbon monoxide is to not start with a dot structure, but just to start with carbon and oxygen and just think, is it going to be single, double, or triple? And if it's single, I need 14 electrons. If it's going to be single, that's like Cl2. 
Cl2 has 14 electrons, go Cl, single bond Cl, and then lone pairs are on the other atoms. That's 14 electrons. So if I have 14 electrons for a diatomic molecule, then it's going to have a single bond. If I have 12 electrons, that's like O2. So if I have 12 electrons, the screen doesn't work right there. So if I have 12 electrons, then oxygen goes double because then I have 12 electrons, so I have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 electrons with a double bond. So if I only have 10, it's going to be like N2. So when I have N2, I have a triple bond with two lone pairs on each atom, and that's 10 electrons, and that's the right count for N2. Same thing for carbon monoxide. So for carbon monoxide, I go with a triple bond. I almost don't even start with the thought of the dot structure. So sometimes you may wonder, how do I know when to start with dots, or when do I need to just think of the atoms versus how many electrons? If we just add the electrons up, we're almost never gonna get the wrong answer. If we think, even for larger molecules, if we always start with a count of the valence electrons and then how are they gonna distribute themselves, we'll always get towards the right answer if we go with that approach. Sometimes if we start with a dot structure, we're gonna get lost in some different types of Lewis structures. So sometimes it'll work fine. Like it works with O2, N2, would be tricky for CO. So I end up with this Lewis structure for a carbon monoxide. Now, what would the formal charge be for carbon? So if I imagine the triple bond, which has six total electrons, if I break those bonding pair of electrons in half, do you see that the charge on carbon isn't zero? What's the formal charge on carbon? Is it plus or minus? So what would the charge of carbon be if it had five valence electrons? It's minus one, right? So the charge here is minus. Now how do I calculate that formal charge? Or how do I know pre precisely how to get that as minus one and not plus one? Well, I think of it this way. Carbon's valence count is four. So I take the valence electrons for an atom, and I take the total electrons around the atom, which is five, and so carbon should have four electrons for neutral charge. It has five electrons surrounding it, so my calculation ends up being four minus five for a minus one charge. So you're taking the, the valence electrons that an atom should have, because that would be the count that gives the atom a neutral charge, and then you subtract the electrons closest to it in the Lewis structure by breaking the bonding pair electrons in half. So I'll do this for oxygen. So we break that, the bonding pair electrons in half, so oxygen now has five electrons surrounding it. Oxygen should have six, though. So six gives ox oxygen a neutral charge. We only have five, so that's how we get plus one for oxygen. So just like oxidation numbers have to sum to the overall charge of the molecule, just like the charges in ionic compounds have to sum up to the total charge of the molecule, the formal charges have to sum up to the total charge. So minus one plus one equals neutral. So the total charge here is neutral. We see that it's neutral when we add up those formal charges. So formal charges are working just like any other charge that we could have. And so, but notice here that carbon is negative, oxygen positive in terms of formal charge. Now carbon in the real molecule CO has a negative charge. The oxygen atom does have a positive charge in the oxygen atom. This is actually why carbon monoxide turns out to be so deadly. It's because the carbon atom attaches the hemoglobin if you breathe it in, and it irreversibly attaches. O atoms will irreversibly attach, so an O atom, like O2, binds the hemoglobin through the O atom, and it can be removed in exchange with CO2. But for whatever reason, that C in carbon monoxide attaches the hemoglobin and never comes back off. So if you breathe too much in, what happens is your blood has no ability to actually absorb oxygen then out of air because it's all been um, attached with carbon monoxide molecules. So this is a, an interesting artifact of carbon monoxide. It explains why it has a different behavior than things like O2, but it's the carbon that bears a, a negative charge. An interesting problem is to do the dipole moment for CO problem with its bond length. It actually turns out to have an actual charge of about negative 0.02. The negative charge on carbon turns out to be pretty small. Why? Because these electron pairs should shade towards oxygen. So the, the triple bond Oxygen's more electronegative still. Oxygen's gonna try to pull that triple bond towards itself. It just can't win back more than one electron. So it just can't win back enough of the electron pairs in the bond for oxygen to switch back to neutral or to negative, and it stays with a positive charge. So oxygen stays partial negative, or excuse me, oxygen stays as the partial positive atom, and then carbon turns out to be partial negative.
So we can think formal charges, assume the bonding pair electrons are equally shared, and then break that assumption, think about electronegativity, think about oxygen being more electronegative, and picks up less of a positive charge than we may have thought, but still overall partial positive. Okay, so what do we do with charge? So if I'm looking at NO+, plus, for NO+, plus, we take five for nitrogen, that's its valence count. We're just looking at position on the periodic table here. We're just looking oxygen has six valence electrons. And then to pick up a net positive charge means we have to lose one of those electrons. For NO to be positive in charge, we have to lose an electron. So if I see plus, I have to subtract an electron. If I see plus two, subtract two electrons. And so this gives me 10 total electrons for NO+. Plus. So for NO+, plus, same Lewis structure as carbon monoxide. So the nitrogen formal charge should be zero. How do I get zero? Nitrogen should have five electrons for neutral charge, and it does have five electrons surrounding it. So the formal charge on nitrogen is zero, and the formal charge on oxygen is six minus five for plus one. So zero plus one gives me the right overall charge of plus one for this ion. And so oxygen here is the uh, positive atom, nitrogen is the neutral atom. Now again, think about electronegativity. Which atom's more electronegative, N or L? O. So oxygen is going to try to pull these electron pairs closer towards itself. It's going to end up with actually a positive charge that's greater than plus one. The nitrogen atom is going to end up partial negative. So you can always think about assuming the electron pair is equally shared, calculate the formal charges, and then let go of that assumption. Let go of the electrons being equally shared. Where are they going? Probably towards the O, um, not towards the N. What do we do with the negative charge? For NO minus, we'd have five for nitrogen, six for O, and then we add an electron. So to pick up a net negative charge means we have to have minus one, uh, uh, to get a minus one charge means we have more than one electron. We, so we add that one electron for the charge in. That gives me 12 total electrons. And so now this should be just like oxygen, double bond, just like O2. And now, again, if I break the bond in half, calculate my formal charges, what's the formal charge on nitrogen? Should have five to be neutral, and it has six. So that's minus one. Oxygen should have six, and it does have six. So that's neutral. It should have six to be zero in charge, and it does have six. So if you think of formal charge, you're really just trying to say, just like picture that atom. What would the charge of that atom be? That's the, the concept of formal charge is just saying, well, if that's a, an atom or ion that we're encountering, it would have a minus charge. If we're encountering this, that would have a neutral charge. OK, so for diatomic molecules, satisfy the octet rule if you can. <coughs> And we'll see towards the end of the notes what we do if there's an odd count of electrons. So if we do have an odd count and can't satisfy the octet rule, we'll look at some examples um, towards the very end of the notes. But as long as we have at least eight electrons and an even count, we can satisfy the octet of both atoms with either a, a double bond if there's 12, triple bond if there's only 10, and if we have 14 electrons with a single bond. Okay, now what do we do for larger molecules? Well, we could try for like something like CCL4. Like one thing that works for some molecules is just picturing the dot structure and then picturing chlorine having its dot structure. So seven valence electrons for the chlorines, four for carbon. This works perfectly fine for some molecules, but for others it may not work as well. Or we may have to rearrange electrons. It may be kind of hard to see how to do that. But for some molecules, this will work just fine. And sometimes you'll see enough examples that you'll kind of know a Lewis structure too. So sometimes you'll know a Lewis structure from analogy or from doing it a few times. Um, but for this structure here, you could just go to the dot structure, but there is a different set of rules that we can apply that will get to this exact same structure. And for some more complicated molecules, a lot of ions are tricky too. We need like a more sophisticated set of rules. Um, so the rules would kind of go, if we want to do this from, from scratch, if you will, what we want to do is sum up the valence electrons of the atom and we want to try to identify the central atom. I almost never try to hide the central atom from you guys. The central atom is almost always the first atom, and then all the other atoms after are attached to that atom. Um, so it's usually not too hard to identify the central atom. The book mentions that usually the central atom is the lesser less negative atom. And I'm like, you know, like we almost always give you the first atom and then the things attached to it next. You know, so it's not hard to identify the central atom. 
And there's a lot of examples where we could put the more electronegative atom in the center. So it's not always going to be the lesser electronegative atom in the center. But it's almost always going to be the thing there's one of is the central atom. The thing that there's more than one of are attached to it. And so then if we're counting up the valence count for CCL4, so if we're trying to come up with this Lewis structure again, um, we take 4 for carbon, the valence count for carbon, 4 times 7 for the chlorines, that's 32 valence electrons, 28 plus 4. And so we have 32 electrons to distribute between the molecule, and we attach the atoms to their central atom first with a single bond. So we have carbon, so we single bond the chlorines. And then we complete the octets, but this is key here, for the non-central atoms. So I complete the octet for the atoms with electron pairs. So I give lone pairs to the non-central atom. If I contrast this real quick with NF3, so if I'm looking at NF3 and comparing this, I'd have 5 for nitrogen, 3 times 7 for the, the fluorines, so that's a total of 26 electrons. So when I'm doing the Lewis structure for NF3, I have nitrogen, three fluorines, single bonded, lone pairs around each of the F to get to eight total electrons for the fluorines. What this means is I don't yet add two electron pairs to nitrogen by rule. So the central atom, I don't automatically put electron pairs. I have to count the electrons I have available to see if I have electrons to put on the central atom. So for CCL4, we're good at this point. For CCL4, we've distributed eight total electrons on each of the chlorines. So I've distributed all of my electrons. Let's come back to that structure in a minute to make sure that it's good. But for NF3, what I do is I, um, you know, I want to place any unassigned electrons onto the central atom. So to determine if I have unassigned electrons, I just need to count that I've distributed 24 so far, so my unassigned electrons, the two electrons, those are, in seeing that I have two left over, go on to NF3 and replace those lone pairs onto NF3. Um, every time I teach, I think of examples in a different order, but let's look at BF3 real quick. So we did BF3 in terms of a Lewis structure previously. If, if you remember, we did it with a click structure because boron has three valence electrons. So if you remember, we did this before. Do you, if, you, if you remember, we were just kind of looking at it like this. And I can't remember if we did BCL3, BF3, or BH3. But all three of those are molecules that exist. Um, and then they exist where we don't have the octet satisfied on boron. And so it's real quick by the rules here, see that we take our valence count. So I have 24 electrons, so I have a central boron, put my three fluorines just like NF3. And that's all 24 electrons. So I have none left over. So no electrons left over. So there's no electrons left over to put two onto boron. So for NF3, electron pairs on the nitrogen. For BF3, no lone pair. Uh, electrons left over for the boron atom. But now let's see the next rule here. So it says if there's not enough electrons to give the non-central atoms an octet, consider multiple bonds. And when I consider a multiple bond for NF3, if I move an electron pair into here and I try to make this bond here, where I make a fluorine boron double bond, there's something pretty bad with this. So two of the fluorines were exactly as they were. I haven't changed the electron count. I just made a double bond and I lost and I moved like a, a pair of electrons from one of the fluorines to make a double bond. What's bad with this is the formal charges. When I take the BF3 that I started with here, I have a zero charge on boron. Should have three valence electrons, it does. Has a nice formal charge of zero, fluorine zero. Now think about the, what the fluorine atoms are going to do in the real molecule BF3. BF3, Fluorine's really electronegative. Boron's really not electronegative. The fluorine atoms are trying to pull the electrons away so that fluorine can adopt a negative charge. So the partial charges should be negative on fluorine and a big partial positive on the center of that molecule on the boron atom. Now think about what making that double bond would do. This double bond would make boron be negative in formal charge. 
because its formal charge would now be three minus four. So boron would have four electrons closest to it. So its formal charge should have three, now it has four. So why would an atom, how can an atom possibly, that doesn't have very much positive charge at all, so little charge it actually won't even pull the single bond towards itself, how's it gonna pull a, a multiple bond towards itself? The answer is it's not gonna happen. So this doesn't happen here. So how do I know this by rule? And so one of them is that the, for, um, the uh, formal charge rule can allow an oct, well, um, sorry, let me, so what I want to do is I want to minimize the magnitudes of formal charge by considering multiple bonds. So if I can make a multiple bond that lowers the magnitudes of charge, then I can make a multiple bond. I can't make this bond here because I've maximized formal charges. I've increased the magnitudes of charge. And so that's not possible. That's not going to happen in a real molecule. That's not going to be a good description of the bonding in a molecule like BF3. So BF3 turns out to be perfectly happy with three single bonds between B and F, where boron's deficient of an octet. So we can have atoms not satisfy the octet because they're deficient, and you're gonna see that this is common in stable molecules where it turns out that all the atoms are neutral in charge. So we'll see a lot of compounds form where all the atoms are neutral in charge. Like, let's look at CCL4. Carbon's charge is zero. Chlorine's charge is zero. So carbon's four minus four, and the chlorines are seven minus seven. So the carbons have four electrons near them. The chlorines have seven, that's perfect. So that's a nice stable molecule, has zero formal charges. We turn out to have the octet satisfied in that molecule, but that's not probably why. The octet rule is probably not the driving force. The driving force is just that we can form four bonds because we have four available electrons. We can form three bonds for nitrogen because we have three available electrons and we keep the lone pair. So we keep the lone pair on nitrogen because that gives it a zero charge, the fluorine's zero charges. So not, in, there will be stable molecules that don't have zero formal charges all the way around, but a common observation in stable molecules is that they have zero formal charges, and the, the central atom just either satisfies the octet rule if it were possible, or in the case of BF3, where we can only form three bonds with no lone pair left over, that we just leave the molecule deficient of an octet, and it's perfectly happy, and the molecule can exist and does, and not, maybe it's not always gonna be the most stable molecule, but I think that's stable enough to be shipped and bottled so BF3 is a stable molecule. Okay, so uh, let's look at these two Lewis structures here, just thinking of the role of counting the electrons. Sulfur in the oxygen group, plus seven times six for the fluorines. So that's 42 plus six, that's 48 electrons. So I just, you know, central atom, and I put six fluorines on the atom. I'm not worried about geometry. So I'm not even thinking at all even though I did kind of sketch it with the geometry in a way when we get the three-dimensional shapes, that'll make sense. But we're not thinking of three-dimensionally how this molecule looks yet. Same thing with like CCL4 and F3, BF3. I'm not worried about three-dimensionally where I'm sketching these bonds. That's a chapter nine concept when we get into shapes of molecules. I'm just trying to get electron pairs and bond type. So this chapter is all about is where are the electron pairs, on what atoms are they on, and then are the bonds double, single, triple, and so if I attach my fluorines with single bonds, give each of the fluorines an octet, that's six fluorine atoms times eight each, so that's 48 electrons. And notice the formal charges are great because the formal charge is sulfur. I have one, two, three, four, five, six bonds, break them in half, so sulfur has six electrons surrounding it. What's its formal charge? Neutral. What's fluorine's charge? Should have seven surrounding and it does, it has a neutral charge. So just think of drawing a box around one of the fluorines, that has a neutral charge. So all the fluorines are neutral, and then the sulfur is neutral as well. What about SF4? Six plus four times seven. So one thing probably to not make the mistake of is just to assume that it's like CCL4. Like, Sometimes we make a mistake in Lewis structures where we're like, oh, this is just gonna be exactly like CCL4, and you sketch four single bonds and you don't even count the electrons. Just take the time, especially when you don't know what a Lewis structure is, if you haven't seen a Lewis structure for a molecule, just to do the count. So it's 28 plus six, that's 34 electrons. So that's really the difference between this and C, uh, CF4, are those two extra electrons. Where do they go? Well, single bond the fluorines, give fluorines their octet, 
then count the electrons. So there's eight electrons around each half. There's four half, so that's 32 electrons. And the electrons that are left over, now you may wonder, why is it that we place them on the central atom? Well, the answer is, we've already filled the octets. There's like no room around the fluorines. The next room around fluorines is the larger shell of the atom, which is really hard to put electrons into. That's why noble gases have such positive and unfavorable electron affinity. So the next spot available, the next best spot would be on that central atom. And so at first glance, you're like, are we packing too many electrons around sulfur? If, even if you look at SF6, SF6, you would actually say it expands its octet because it has the central sulfur is surrounded by 12 electrons. So this Lewis structure here, you would say, well, this is an expanded octet. So the Lewis uh, structure shows an expanded octet for SF6. Same thing for SF4. The octet is expanded. There's only um, one rule that kind of dictates when you can expand an octet like this. And this is also common for compounds that actually exist that you can put into a bottle. SF6, you can actually bottle it. You can even breathe it in like helium. makes your voice go deeper instead of higher because it's heavier than air. Um, I've done it before. I don't like doing it. It's, if you've ever done it, it's very chemically as it comes out. It's, I hate doing it. I don't think I'll ever do it again. Um, and I'm not sure what else you're breathing in with it. But SF6, stable enough that you can breathe it in, and it's inert enough that I guess it's not going to kill you immediately. Um, but, but we do have an expanded octet. You can expand an octet when the atoms in the third row are greater. So second row atoms can expand their octet. So you won't see things like OF6 doesn't exist um, as a compound, but SF6 does exist, and it's stable enough to bottle it. So OF6, the sort of second row analog of that molecule, not stable enough to exist. What the problem with the second row atoms is they're so small, and then we gotta pack all those electrons close together around the atom, it just can't work. But sulfur being bigger allows the fluorines to be further away from each other and allows those bonding pair electrons to not repel each other so much that the molecule can exist. So we have 10 electrons around the central atom in sulfur. So that's why we would say sulfur has an expanded octet. So when you're counting an octet, you're kind of counting all the electrons, including all the bonding pair electrons. Um, now, the Lewis structures for these molecules show an expanded octet. But think about the formal charge of sulfur. It's still zero. Should have six, and it has one, two, three, four electrons from the bonding pair, and then two from the non-bonding pair. So six minus six for neutral, and then fluorines are zero as well. Usually, I only write non-zero formal charges in a structure, but you can write the zeros, and it doesn't hurt. But always try to consider what the formal charges are, because they may help us if we've sketched an incorrect structure. So Lewis structure for SF4 shows an expanded octet. Now, think about why, another reason why these molecules exist is that fluorine, being really electronegative, is pulling electrons back off the sulfur. So the only reason the Lewis structure shows an expanded octet is because it has to. You know, like because we're, we're minimally drawing single bonds. We're not drawing less than single bonds, but these molecules aren't going to form. Like, I'm not gonna form SCH3-6 or something like that. I'm not going to form a bond between sulfur and six things where that thing isn't really electronegative. So you can think we put 12 electrons around sulfur with atoms that are gonna pull the electrons back off of sulfur. So what the, electro, what the fluorine atoms are designed to do, the reason why this compound works, is they're pulling those electrons back off of sulfur. There's no easy way to calculate how many electrons still remain closer to sulfur. So I always say the Lewis structure shows an expanded octet. The real molecule is smart. The real molecule only forms because we can actually take those 12 electrons and put them closer towards the F. And that allows the molecule to not really have that many electrons around a re relatively small atom still. So the um, Lewis structures will show an expanded octet. And that's OK as long as we're in the uh, third row or greater in the periodic table. OK, so uh, for like these, we did OF2 earlier, water. This is you know 2 plus 6, that's 8 electrons. So it's relatively straightforward to show these Lewis structures where we end up with the extra electrons on the central atom by rule. So if we start with the two single bonds, hydrogen doesn't need any more electrons. The four electrons left over go onto the central atom. So you can kind of use the rules, or you can just you know, click the atoms together. But if we follow the rules, I think we'll always get the Lewis structures right. So we'll pick up with this slide and some of those bigger molecules and some more examples uh, on my, or not next Monday, a week from Monday. Have a great spring break, everybody. Thanks for being here.